G'day and welcome back. Let's have another look at this lathe. There's quite a bit of backlash in these areas. So let's strip it down, take some measurements and find out what needs remaking. Let's grab a dial indicator and have a closer look at things. On the crossfeed, it looks like I've got about 0.6 millimeters of play, or 24 thou. That's pretty terrible. On the compound, it looks like I have about 0.2 millimeters of play, or 8 thou. That's reasonable. Working from the top down, I'll take off the tool post and then wind out the compound slide. These handles are threaded onto the screws and there's a lock nut on the end to set the play. I actually started this disassembly process with the cross slide and it took me a long time to figure out how to disassemble it. I'll spare you the clips which include blowtorch flames and lots of swearing. It turns out someone had helpfully put Loctite on the threads of the cross slide hand wheel. I guess a nylock nut might help keep things locked up. I'll decide about that later. I'm just removing the compound slide, and to my surprise, the nut of the compound is actually very loose. I'll try nipping up the grub screw, and actually there's a space for a second grub screw, which is missing. And yeah, that's eliminated almost all of the play. Previously, this compound nut felt about as worn out as I look. It's not all good news though. Here's a problem with the gib. The end of it is actually broken off. There should be a slot here which is captive on the adjuster screw, allowing the screw to both push and pull on the gib. As it is, it can only push, so the gib might get wedged in there. That will need attention sooner rather than later, but I won't have time in this video. The compound is connected to an adapter plate, and the adapter plate is connected to the T-slots, and the T-slots are connected to the knee bone. This means I can move the compound forwards or backwards, for larger or smaller jobs, and that gives me a good amount of working range, very handy. There's a pair of thrust bearings in each axis, and they're pretty filthy, and actually one of the balls is missing, so I think I'll grab four new ones for reassembly. Now I'm looking at the crossfeed nut, and I notice that the backlash adjustment is pretty much closed down tight. I want to put the lead screw in there and feel how much wear there is without the compensation, and then close it down and make a comparison. There's still a lot of play, so I think we're going to need at least a new crossfeed nut. Looking inside the nut, I know that these particular threads should have a 0.81mm flat on the crest of the threads, but they're sharp and they're not even full height anymore, so this nut is about to give up entirely. This is an X nut, nailed to the perch, as it were. So 0.6mm of axial play, and sharp threads inside, and no adjustment left. Yeah, it's definitely gotta go. Luckily the screw is in really great condition. The compound nut though, and its screw, are actually in very good condition. I can see those flat thread crests, and there's very little play. Most of the play we saw came from the nut not being fixed properly to the slide. Let's get some metric thread gauges and double check these pitches. I know from the hand wheel markings that they are 2.5mm pitch, but it pays to double check. These are definitely both 2.5mm screws. And the clearance holes should be 125 for a 15mm thread. You can see that the crossfeed one is a bit more worn out, and it's 127 Now I think the reason the crossfeed nut has gone has got to be because the oiler for the screw is damaged. And looking at the dirt in there, it hasn't been used in a while. I'm just measuring up approximately with my transfer punches to see what size these holes are and I'll get some of these oilers on order. They won't arrive in time for this video to go out, but they can be changed soon. So, 
That's one bad nut, one good nut, and two good screws. It could have been a lot worse. I'll get some outside measurements for this nut, because it definitely needs replacement. I've got this piece of aluminium bronze, which I will admit does look like brass, but I'll show you why I think it's bronze. This is brass, and it has no response at all to the magnets. And this is the aluminium bronze, and the magnets do stick to it slightly. There's quite often a few percent of nickel and iron in aluminium bronze, and that's one of the ways to test for it with a magnet. Aluminium bronze is also slightly harder than tin bronze, so I previously did a scratch test, and this new piece here was able to scratch the original nut, but not vice versa. Brass would have failed that test, being softer than both. And one final clue that this is bronze, not brass. There is visible wear on here that looks like it's been used as a machine shaft. Okay, I've just cut a blank out, and it's big enough to get the new nut out of. What I need to do now is block this piece up. So I'm standing it on one parallel and pinching it with a V-block so that the bottom face doesn't influence the squareness of my clamping. I've got to pick out a sharp end mill, and this one's high speed steel and it will be ideal for the bronze. I'm just going to deck off the top, because the finish on here is just a bandsaw cut at the moment. Now I'm standing the part up on two parallels, and I'm holding it by the newly squared up faces. I just can't resist using my lapping plate, which is just a sheet of fine wet and dry attached to a flat panel. Seems like any time I'm using some kind of yellow metal, I can't resist putting a nice shiny finish on it. Just the last few tooling marks to get rid of on that one. Obviously this is going back to the mill vise, and although the lapping doesn't take off much size, if I lap as I go, I don't end up with a grossly undersized part at the end. On the last cuts, I try to leave on a bit of extra material for the final finish. With that said, for the dimensions on this block, all but one of them are totally unimportant. They're all just clearance. The faces and edges are all just sitting in fresh air and don't mate up with anything. The only measurement that really matters is the top face of the nut. That's the bit that touches the moving half of the cross slide and the height of the finished trapezoidal thread. That's critical. If that height is wrong, then it will force the screw to sit at an angle and we'll get binding and premature wear on the nut, the screw, and probably the bearings too. Although most of the dimensions here are not important, as I said, I do like trying to work the dimensions as though they are critical. It's good practice for me, for when it's really needed. You can't see it very well here, but I'm using Robin Renzetti's lapping technique, where he suggests that we push down on the trailing edge of the piece being lapped, and that seems to result in a nice flat face. I like it when the things that I make look good, as well as work well. And all too often, they look terrible and work badly. The last cuts are the end faces of this block, and I decided to side mill those. I find that with side milling, if I use a slow stream of air to get rid of the slivers that are produced, I get a much better finish, and no chip recutting. So I'm trying to inspect the hole size in the middle of the existing nut to get a location. I don't have pin gauges yet, I'd love a set, but they're still on the wish list, so the best I can do is use a fairly new set of twist drills, and this is an imperial half inch or 12.7mm bit, and it fits in there very snugly left to right, but pretty slack up and down. The thread being this worn means we'll have to find an average somehow. So here's the block, milled to size, everything matches and it's the right size. Now we need to find out and mark some of those important dimensions. I've stripped off my surface plate. Normally it's dressed head to toe in rubber, which is of course very nice, but it makes access difficult. I'm taking the scriber out of my height gauge. Now I've fit up the holder for my DTI. Oh crap, I remember, it doesn't fit. I've actually used a small clamp to hold this DTI holder on before, and it works well, but it's a bit of an ugly, unsatisfying solution, so I think a bit of a detour here will be justified. Okay, this scriber measures a hair under 10mm, and the DTI holder measures a hair under 127 so I wonder if I can modify it. It's been blackened, so I expect it's also hard. I'll use this Live Tools carbide end mill again, and I'll just go very steady. And it's actually milling very nicely. I did touch it with a file before milling, and it did cut, so it's not harder than my files, but that's not saying much. I don't think it's mild or annealed, but it's machining well at least.
and checking that with the mic. And I'm two hundredths of a mil up, which is ideal for lapping allowance. This is the lapped finish and I can't feel any step, so that's a good size match too. I clamp that into the arm of the height gauge and now it fits beautifully. This lets me use my nice stable height gauge to drive my DTI around on my surface plate. Brilliant. Quick tip for beginners, DTI stands for Dodgy Tolerance Investigator. Now I have a nice straight piece of 12.7mm stainless rod. I have the old bronze nut very lightly clamped to the plate, just so I'm not deforming anything. I just want to keep it from rocking and rolling while I'm trying to get some peace and quiet. There's tons of play in the vertical plane. I'll have to double and triple check the height alignment of this nut when it comes to reassembling the lathe. That vertical plane might mean that the height of the thread is set wrong, or if perhaps the slides have worn, it may have worn to a new vertical position that's wrong. The nut may need shimming or shortening, but I'll look at that later. I'll need to find a happy average horizontal position for this rod, so I'm using an adjustable parallel at one end to start with, and I'm not quite getting a zero just yet, so I'll just make a few adjustments. The adjustable parallel isn't really meant to go this narrow, but I'm making it work with a bit of overhang. After some fiddling around, I can get it to read zero at the end and zero near the nut. And I measure that parallel and I get 9.03 mil. So just to double check things and to give my gauge blocks some exercise and fresh air, I'm going to ring up a stack that matches that size to double check the measurement. I'll slide that underneath the rod, zero it on the DTI, and now on the outboard end I have it zeroed. And on the inboard end, I've centered the zero point within the range of movement. And this is how I work out my average. Now all I need to record is my gauge block stack height and half the diameter of the rod. And that's where I'll vertically put a thread through this nut. I've got a few more measurements to take. These are the unimportant measurements, so a caliper measurement is fine. Most of this doesn't need to fit anything, but I'll do as good a job as I can anyway. I don't want it being very different to the original. Now I'll make a trapezoidal cutting tool by repurposing this old threading tool. I'll start by colouring it in blue, and scribe in on a 30 degree angle square to the shank of the tool. I'll think about tip width later. For now I just want to get the overall 30 degree shape and the clearance is needed for a left hand thread. And after a bit of freehand grinding, I'm there. The flanks seem to match up, the width seems to match up well with an unworn piece of screw, and the way I got the tip width right is a method that I copied from Abom. I set the calipers to the right size and then I just kept honing the tooltip until it only just catches in both directions. Okay, that's done. If the tooltip is slightly narrower than the spec, that's better than it being wider. It does make the tool a little weaker and it does mean you need to cut slightly deeper than the book says, but the slight bit of extra clearance in the thread root doesn't hurt anything. Not enough clearance, of course, is a problem. So now I'm going to use a little bit of layout blue on the block. This will help with marking out. I'd like to mark out these using my scribing tool on the height gauge. There are six lines to scribe and there are a few different dimensions. Here I've got the main hole for the lead screw thread, then there's the clamp hole for the backlash adjuster, and the mounting hole. Both those two are M6. I'm using a tool here called a prick punch. Now that sounds terribly painful, but really it's very handy. It's a sharper, thinner version of a centre punch. It's good for getting the location right. 
I line it up best I can, then rotate 90 and have another look to make sure I'm dead on. Once those are marked, I follow it up with a normal center punch, which has a wider angle. This locates easily in the previous marks, and it deepens and widens the punch mark. Just visually comparing those locations, and I'm pretty happy with how those have come out. They look good to me and my highly myopic eyes. At the mill, I'll use my homemade 60 degree pointer in a collet chuck and locate those points. Then I'll set the DRO zero just in case, and I lock both axes. I don't have the pointy type of wiggler, only a cylindrical style edge finder. So I made this pointer tool for locating punch marks, and that seems to work well for me. I'll use the spot drill to give myself a good location. Then I can use the tap drill size for the mounting hole. I'm mixing up the order of things here, and I'm doing this hole ahead of the lead screw threads, because these two threads intersect. I think it will be better if the lead screw threads are clean and unimpeded by burrs. So I'll do this one first, and the lead screw after. I can easily rechase the M6 threads later, but I can't easily clean the internals of the lead screw thread. Now it's time to align the stock in the fore jaw with some small aluminium pads, and I'm using the old trick of indicating on a free floating dead centre. That came out pretty well aligned. I'll drill this out to 12.5mm, which is the correct minor diameter for the new internal thread. and I'll deburr that freshly cut edge. I've set up the lathe change gears and gearbox for a metric 2.5mm pitch, but because it's an internal thread, it's not that easy to measure the pitch of a scratch pass. So instead I've come up with another way. I'm making a mark on the chuck and headstock with a sharpie, and I'm using a long travel indicator to see how far my carriage moves for one spindle rotation. A DRO would make this even easier, of course. I'll test the pitch a few times, but my chuck rotation accuracy is not bang on. Still, even with my bang off technique, there's no cumulative error after several passes, so I know the setting must be right. Everything seems good, so I'm quite happy that we're ready to go. So I'll take a scratch pass anyway, and that goes smoothly. I need to leave the lead screw engaged because this is an imperial lathe and I'm cutting a metric thread. And now it's just a lot of rinse and repeat. I can only push the tool forwards out of the cut a small amount before the tool starts rubbing on the back of the bore. So I've marked a couple of points on the crossfeed dial with a sharpie, which gives me some zero points with backlash taken into account in both directions. This just makes things more foolproof and allows me to feed out of the cut for the return passes and it puts the tool in the centre of the available gap, which is the safest thing for this fragile tool. And I'm periodically just sanity checking with the lead screw to make sure that I've not reached size ahead of time. There's a lot of repetition here and I'm only taking 5 thou per cut because I'm feeding in perpendicular with the cross slide. I've locked up the compound gib to provide some extra stability and take one more variable out of the equation. Eventually that lead screw goes all the way in and it was a very firm fit, no play in any direction and it took quite a grip on the lead screw to get it into the nut. It did go all the way in by hand, didn't need any tools, but it was very, very firm. So I just took one more final one thou axial clearance cut, just so there's a nice free running thread fit with no binding or problems. We've got to remember this thread needs space for an oil film. So this is the final nut. It looks great to me and it works great. And you can see I chose not to machine the backlash compensation just yet. I've got it marked out and it's ready to go. I just thought that until there's some wear on this nut, and that could take years, it's going to perform better as a lead nut while it's a single block. And there's very little extra work to cut the slot and the thread and pop a cap screw in there. So let's get this nut back on the lathe. I won't show the assembly in detail because it's just the reverse of what I showed earlier. 
I am including these new thrust bearings though, which will definitely help. The only note in reassembly is really that I keep the nut mounting screw loose until everything is tight together and aligned, and this makes sure the nut is pointing the right way. So here is the new backlash measurement, absolutely minimal. I'd say that's about as good as I could ever expect. Somewhere around 50 microns or two thou. Very nice. This cross slide will now be a joy to use, at least until it wears in. There's still more to do on the lathe, but now it's running and functional, hopefully I can start using it as my daily driver. Thanks for watching, see you next time.